Good evening, I'm Prasad Michael and you're watching Kini News, the show that brings you today's biggest stories. After 32 police reports were lodged over the controversial book cover, cops are not wasting their time. Today they raided a company linked to the book. A company in Pataling Jaya linked to the controversial book cover which allegedly resembles the National Code of Arms has been raided by the police. Bukit Aman Criminal Investigations Department Director Hosir Muhammad said 313 copies of the book were seized during the operation carried out by a team from the CID's Classified Criminal Investigation Unit. Team daripada USJT telah uh, melakukan serbuan di uh, sebuah syarikat di Petaling Jaya. Tang tadi masih lagi eh? masih lagi tengah buat eh? dan uh, Hasil daripada sesatan di tempat uh, serbuan tersebut, kita telah uh, dapat maklumat yang menyatakan sejumlah seribu buah buku telah dicetak. During the raid, police discovered that a large portion of the books that were printed have already been distributed to customers and now they'll be focusing their attention on identifying those who created it, especially the cover. Sejumlah 313 buah naskah uh, yang uh, masih disimpan dan uh, 687 naskah telah diedar diedar setelah uh, pembelian dibuat secara online ok dan kita juga telah uh, dalam proses untuk uh, membuat penelitian terhadap buku tersebut kita tengok siapa dia punya writer dan sebagainya lah so usaha untuk mendapatkan uh, siapa yang uh, design dia punya cover dan sebagainya sedang dilakukan while Huzer did not reveal the company during his press conference he is believed to have been referring to the Gerak Budaya Publishing Company which published the book Huzer added that police have received 32 reports on the matter this comes after the Home Ministry ordered the police to probe the matter. According to graphic designer Fahmi Reza, the image used on the book cover was an oil painting that was publicly exhibited six years ago when the country was under the Barasan National Administration. Earlier today, before the raid started, Gerak Budaya issued an apology to anyone offended by the cover. The publisher of a book at the centre of a police investigation of its cover that resembles the National Code of Arms or Jata Nagara has apologised. Speaking to Malaysia Kini, director and founder of Gerak Budaya Publishing Company, Chong Thon Sin, said there was no intention to insult the National Code of Arms with the book cover. However, he added that regardless of being unintentional, he apologised to anyone offended by the cover. The book, titled Rebirth, Reformacy, Resistance and Hope in New Malaysia, came under intense scrutiny over the last couple of days after several popular Facebook pages highlighted it on the social media platform. They alleged that the use of the image on the cover was an insult to the National Code of Arms. On Monday alone, 21 police reports were lodged against the cover, with Bukit Aman Criminal Investigations Department Deputy Director Mior Farid al Trash Wahid saying investigation papers have been opened. Chong said the police visited his office in Pataling Jaya yesterday afternoon to see him, but he was away at the time. He believes the police would come again today, and he was ready to cooperate. Malaysia Kini has attempted to get comments from editor Keen Wong, but he declined to comment. As many countries experience spikes in new COVID-19 cases, Malaysia still seems to have it under control. The latest update from the Health Ministry continues a streak of hope in the battle against COVID-19 as Malaysia reported only two new cases today, one imported and one local. Both cases involve Malaysians with one from Sabah and the other from Selangor. The patient from Selangor has been identified as having returned from Egypt recently and was thus classified as an imported case. Meanwhile, 20 patients were discharged today, putting the total active cases in Malaysia at 164 four of whom are in the ICU with one requiring breathing assistance. The total number of cumulative cases in Malaysia stands at 8,639. There were no deaths from the coronavirus reported today, maintaining the death toll at 121. How much of the country's forest reserves are actually natural forests with a thriving ecosystem? You'd be surprised. Single species plantations within permanent forest reserves should be discouraged as it would be harmful to the forest ecosystem. This is the message delivered to Putrajaya by several environmental NGOs today. 
Their message comes as the government looks to finalize the latest version of the Malaysian forestry policy. Jadi apa makna nama nama hutan simpanan kekal tetapi bukan berhutan. Jadi seolah-olah uh, mengabui mata umum bahawa kononnya Malaysia dilitupi oleh hutan tetapi realitinya 27.5 uh, 27.57% daripada keluasan hutan simpanan kekal di negeri Kelantan tu bukan hutan. Itu itu ladang hutan saja. Belum kita ambil kira dalam hutan simpanan kekal ada lombong. Dalam hutan simpanan kekal ada kuari. Jadi berapa peratus sahaja yang tinggal Mio presented the media with maps and lists of concessionaires which showed the extent of such plantations in permanent forest reserves in Kelantan, Kedah, Perak, Pahang and Terengganu. The concessionaires included firms linked to state governments. Portions of forest reserves along with protected trees were often cleared to make way for monoculture or single species plantations for cash crops like musang king durian or rubber. Not only did this contradict the biodiverse nature of a forest, but plantations were also detrimental to wildlife and local communities like the orang asli, who rely on the forest for food and other purposes, Mio added. Land matters are under the jurisdiction of state governments. Mio further criticised this practice of converting permanent forest reserves into plantations while still maintaining a veneer of the former. Dr. Martha nominated Shafi Abdal as Harapan Plus PM candidate, but Ahmad Mazlan just can't believe it. Dr. Mahathir Mohamad's proposal for Warisan President Shafi Abdal to become Prime Minister if Pakatan Harapan and its allies can regain federal power has left many in shock. Apparently, it was so shocking that it even left UMNO Secretary General Ahmad Mazlan lost for words. Tak ada apa yang mengejutkan saya, Datuk. Dah tak ada yang mengejutkan. Dalam politik Malaysia ni dah tak ada yang mengejutkan. Tapi sehari dua ni saya terkejut. Hmm. Satu perkara. Calon Perdana Menteri ialah Shafi Abdal dari Sabah. Itu <laughs> saya ada istilah apa terkejut beruk ke apa ke? Ah. Ha, saya... Ahmad said it was particularly shocking because he has worked with Shafi in UMNO. Kawan lama saya, okay? uh, dia pernah duduk uh, satu meja dengan saya tujuh ta lima tahun. Oh, lama? Lama. Satu hmm. meja apa tu? Satu meja mesyuarat. Siapa pengurusinya tu? Tan Sri Muhyiddin Yassin. Uh, mesyuarat apa tu? Jawatan Kuasa Pengurusan UMNO ah, Saya Ketua Pengurusan Penerangan UMNO Dia naik Presiden hmm. uh, Tansi Muhyiddin Timbalan Presiden Lima tahun Satu hmm. meja mesyuarat hmm. Saya tahulah siapa uh, Datuk Seri Syafiq Abdal kan? hmm. uh, Jadi saya terkejut beruk lah Bila hmm. jadi calon Perdana hmm. Menteri hmm. <laughs> Ahmad said he wouldn't be as shocked If Shafi was proposed to be The Deputy Prime Minister candidate He explained that Based on the number of Parliament seats in Sabah Compared to Peninsula Malaysia It would be more fitting For Shafi to be the Deputy Yesterday, the Sabah Chief Minister said he is grateful for the proposal, but he needed to consult his political colleagues first. Amana and DAP have said they viewed Shafi's nomination as an option, but they needed to discuss the matter internally as well as at the Harapan Presidential Council. Coming up next, WHO warns the pandemic is not even close to being over. Here in Malaysia, COVID-19 appears to be under control, but the WHO has warned that the worst is yet to come. The World Health Organization issued a stark warning that the worst is yet to come from COVID-19 and that the pandemic is in fact accelerating around the world. I'm sorry to say that, but with this kind of environment and condition, we fear the worst. And that's why we have to bring our acts together and fight this dangerous virus. WHO Chief Tadros Arnom told a briefing on Monday that it is not even close to being over. We all want this to be over. We all want to get on with our lives. But the hard reality is this is not even close to being over. Although many countries have made some progress globally, it's, the pandemic is actually speeding up. Tedros also slammed countries facing issues with contact tracing. 
Trust me, no excuse for contact tracing. If any country is saying contact tracing is difficult, it is a lame excuse. Contact tracing involves identifying anyone exposed to an infected person and sending them into quarantine. Thedros noted June 30th marked six months since the WHO received its first reports of the outbreak in China, and since then, 10 million people have been infected across the world and 500,000 deaths recorded. The WHO plans to send a team to China next week to investigate the origins of the virus to further understand it. U.S. President Donald Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have both said that the disease could have escaped from a lab in Wuhan, although they have not presented any evidence. China has denied this, and scientists say the virus emerged in nature. After 40 years, the Golden State Killer faces justice in California. How do you plead? Guilty. He terrorized California with a string of slayings, rapes and break-ins in a crime wave dating back to the mid-1970s. And on Monday, the Golden State Killer finally faced justice. 74-year-old ex-policeman Joseph James D'Angelo on Monday admitted guilt to a multitude of crimes in front of victims and their families in a ballroom at Sacramento State University instead of a courthouse to allow social distancing. In all, D'Angelo agreed to plead guilty to 13 counts of first-degree murder. The scope of Joseph D'Angelo's crime spree is simply staggering, encompassing 13 known murders and almost 50 rapes between 1975 and 1986. D'Angelo entered the plea as part of a broader agreement with prosecutors from 11 California counties to admit all allegations against him, charged and uncharged. Under the terms of the plea deal, D'Angelo is spared a potential death sentence but will face life in prison without the possibility of parole. Do you understand, Mr. D'Angelo, that you'll be entering guilty pleas to 13 counts of murder in the first degree, admitting special circumstances, enhancements, as well as admitting to uncharged acts? Do you understand that, sir? Yes. It's anticipated that you will receive 11 consecutive life without the possibility of parole sentences with 15 concurrent life sentences. Additional time for weapon enhancements will be imposed as mandated by law. Do you understand that as well, sir? Y yes. As a condition of this plea, you will agree to waive any and all appellate rights. Uh, do you understand the terms of this plea, Mr. D'Angelo? Yes, you are. D'Angelo's arrest in 2018 came after more than 40 years of investigation in a case that authorities said was finally solved by comparing crime scene DNA evidence to information on genealogy websites used to track ancestry. The breakthrough came about two months after the case gained renewed national attentions in the best-selling book I'll Be Gone in the Dark. A TV documentary series spawned by the book premiered by Coincidence on HBO on Sunday. And that is all for me today. For more stories, you can go to kinetv.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook for the latest news updates. We'll be back with more tomorrow, same time, same place. I'm Prasad Michael. Thank you for watching.